Lisa. this morning, friends were driving by like, oh, aren't you freezing? I'm like, no. No, it feels great, yeah. Exactly, it feels like a million bucks. It's about to be 90 for the next six months. Exactly. I'd like to call to order the City of Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Meeting for March 20th, 2023. Let the record show it is 5.02 p.m. Ms. Miller, if you could please call the roll. Chris Brown. Here. Gregory Snyder. Here. Christina Morrison. Present. Joy Howe. Yes, here. Helen Zeller. Here. Julian Blankenship. Here. Chris Davey. Here. Let the record show all seven members of the board are here. Um, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion I don't think there are any changes. Motion to approve. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Second by Ms. Blankenship. Sorry, before we do a vote, can we actually make one adjustment? We're just going to move up the artificial turf into the presentation section because she's not actually asking for a motion on that. She just wants to discuss it with you guys. So it'd be um, it become uh, 7B and then the next one would be, so then it'd be 9A and 9B. Well, yeah, we just call them 9A and B. So what we're really doing is taking 9A and making that 7B. Yeah, right. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, Motion to approve as amended. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Second by Ms. Blankenship. Ms. Miller, if you can please call the roll. Chris Brown. Yes. Gregory Snyder. Yes. Christina Morrison. Yes. Joy Howell. Yes. Alan Zeller. Yes. Julian Blankenship. Yes. Chris Davey. Yes, let the record show that passed 720. Um, as all my colleagues had an opportunity to review the minutes from January 3rd, 2023. And yes, motion to approve. Second. Second by Ms. Blankenship, motion by Ms. Morrison. Ms. Miller, if you could please call the roll. So the, who made the motion? Ms. Like Morrison and Ms. Blankenship, again. <laughs> Chris Brown. Yes. Gregory Snyder. Yes. Christina Morrison. Yes. Joy Howell. Yes. Alan Zeller. Yes. Julian Blankenship. Yes. Chris Davey. Yes. Let the record show the agenda was approved 720. The minutes were approved 720. I would now ask every member of the general public who is here this evening who may be asked to speak um, or who may like to speak before the board to rise and please be sworn. Please raise your right hand by the authority vested me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Thank you very much. Excuse me, I'm going to ask our attorney, Kelly. Um, I don't need to read the quasi judicial rules because there is none tonight. Correct. Okay, just wanted to make sure you didn't have a problem with that. And um, I guess at this moment, I will ask for comments from the public on item on any issue that is not on our agenda tonight. If a member of the public wishes to speak on any item that is not on our agenda, now is your time to rise and approach the podium to my left. At this point, we actually, we don't generally recognize public comment for the legislative items either, unless the board, unless it's the board's pleasure. So if you wanted to speak on a legislative item, you could come up now, unless you'd rather them speak during the legislative item. They're probably here for the CIP. Yeah, these people are here for the CIP stuff. I'm almost willing to bet on it. And if we come to an item and a member of the public does want to it, uh, comment. If my colleagues don't have a problem, I certainly don't. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, yeah, th yeah no, no. that will be heard, yes, later on this evening. Thank you. But, but it's a presentation, so we wouldn't recognize public comment. So if he wants to go ahead and speak to that. We'll, we'll handle it during the item if they want. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'd, rather hear it, I'd rather hear his comment after city staff has made the presentation anyway. Okay, you guys don't have a problem with that. Pleasure, so that, that's fine. Right, uh, and the Engineers Development Services Director, this is the time to get public input on this proposed ordinance, so we really would want, if it's okay with the board, to, to have people speak after the presentation. Perfect. That, I'm sure that works for my colleagues as well. Um, so seeing 
no member of the public approaching the podium. Uh, I will now close public comment and we can move right into item 7A. Wait, wait, so, on my, do I have to, can I speak now or do I have to can I speak later? You, after the city makes their presentation on the item you're interested in, sir, you'll be given the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Yes, excuse me. No, oh, anyone. <laughs> He's not just the lucky one. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Ms. Dossery, I'll give it to you. It's your item. Thank you. Good evening. So this item of 7A is the initiation of our annual infrastructure improvement hearing. Ms. Dossery, can you speak in public? Yes, and I need to get used to this. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> So this is the initiation of our city's annual infrastructure improvement hearing. It's outlined in our comprehensive plan. It's something we do every year. So this hearing, we will be opening the process to receive public comments. And then at the following meeting on April 17th, we'll be reviewing anything that's come in. So I, I'm going to go over just the process um, and the purpose of this really quickly. So we are receiving input from the public on any uh, capital improvements item over $25,000. Those are what's included in the capital budget. We sent out an email blast on March 10th. We sent it out to the city subscribers and it's on the city's website. And we're gonna continue to gather comments through April 17th and then we'll present those to you all as the board. This is the currently approved capital improvements program budget. It's accessible on the city's website in the, the finance um, subpage. And our comprehensive plan has different criteria that the improvements are reviewed um, based upon whether they're critical, mandatory, or desirable. And <clears throat> so we have the, the different criteria measurements for different. Right. Rebecca, if you could speak up just a little bit more because I'm hearing sure. you can't hear you on the video. Okay. So for the different categories, for critical improvements, mandatory improvements, and desirable improvements, um, there's different um, measures that are used to evaluate whether or not it falls into those categories. Uh, and again, the potential infrastructure needs could be uh, related to deficiencies in any public infrastructure item, and we would welcome any input from the public, and it can be sent to this email address, pzmail at mydelrybeach.com. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs> Great. Um, Great, thank you so much. I'll turn to my colleagues. Um, do you have any particular comments, questions? Have you had not, has anybody taken an opportunity to review? Um, Are we gonna listen to the public first and then talk sure. or should we do after? We, let's do it okay. beforehand. Thank you for the, thank you, Ms. Blankenship. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I would now ask, is any member of the public here who wishes to speak on a particular community improvement project that they've seen or are interested in, or do they have questions? Yes, sir. Please approach the microphone, and if you wouldn't mind, state your name and address for the record. Right. My name is Kong Lam. Uh, my property address is at 912 East Street in Delray Beach. Okay. Um, I prepared. Okay. All right, um, and you obviously know I'm going to talk about the artificial turf amendment. That, that next? We're, we're hearing that at another item. Okay, so this I is about community improvement, oh, okay. and um, uh, it's wait. about please. Ms. Dossery. Yes, if you have any comments on public infrastructure improvements that you would like to see, like if you uh, see a sidewalk project that needs to happen or something related to drainage, those are the types of items that are included in this um, capital improvement process. So you could uh, speak now if you'd like, or you can send an email to the PZ mail at mydelrybeach.com address so that we can have that formally submitted as part of the record. Turf is next. Turf is next. I, I, I will In the next, I will next, next item on the agenda. Yes, ma'am. Please approach, and if you wouldn't mind, just state your name and address for the record. My name is Maureen Smith. I live at 968 Dogwood Drive in Tropic Isles. Mm -hmm. I've lived there since 1999, and I love this little town. Haven't seen a power wash done on any of the sidewalks, um, that major thoroughfares that we tr transverse every day. 
I haven't seen um, curbs power washed. I, I think it's pretty important because you get, you're drawing a lot of people to this town, and it looks like nobody cares. It's 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 something that's right in your face and it's being ignored by I don't know who, what department. It's not my department. I'm also a landscape architect, so I'm very visual about what I'm seeing in, around me every day. And it's, it's such a disappointment to see coming off of I-95, all the trash and the leftover bottles and the garbage, everything in the bushes, and everybody's coming to our great town. That's their introduction. Hello. Just, yeah. We're full of garbage. Um, I, I know what you're speaking about. Um, DOT is supposed to take care of that. But, and I also just want to say that what we're really talking about here are capital improvements. Okay, well, I'm going to get No, no, no. And, and honestly, I can see members of staff taking notes and what have you. What you're really talking about is something that's more of a maintenance issue than it is okay. a capital project. Okay. But I just want to let you know we appreciate your comments. We <laughs> and really I'm do. I'm getting aggravated every time I head to I 95 right. on Linton. And the garbage and the, and the plants, the plants need to be changed out. I mean, it's a beautiful, I mean, we're, so, we're attracting multimillionaires, unfortunately, that have, they're tearing the houses down and doing these big cubes. And I mean, it, it, until you get into my neighborhood, and even in my neighborhood, the right of ways have not been maintained properly for the kind of, kind of money that my neighborhood generates in taxes, the least they could do is come in and trim it up and power wash the, the rims, the, the, um, the curbs and stuff, and the sidewalks on Federal Highway. You, do, you leave here and you, the moment you hit um, Boca Raton, it's beautiful. You leave here and you hit Boynton, Boynton, and it's beautiful. Well, I think we could do better, just saying. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for listening to me. I'm very passionate about it because my kids grew up here, and I don't think I've seen a lot of the stuff power wash on even once. Driving here, the sidewalks are gray, dirty, gray. You think we live in, like, you know, some big city that has a tight budget. So, anyway, my opinion. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I'm very passionate. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think there's any more public comment on this item, so I'll turn to my colleagues on the board. <laughs> um, Mr. Zeller, any comments? No. What? <laughs> Mr. Snyder? Yeah, a couple of things. That, um, and I, I guess I, I'm kind of in the same situation as the lady that just spoke. I noticed one of the things is, and this is not within the city's purview, the, the capital improvement of the city is to is to do widening at Catherine Drive where it meets Linton because the county's putting in a traffic light. Right. Yeah. Well, like we need another traffic light. Mm -hmm. Well. But as I said, that's not within the city's purview. Correct. But I, want, I want to be on record. I don't want that traffic light. <laughs> you got it. And my other question is on the golf course upgrade or the golf course maintenance things. Is that funding generated by the golf course, or is that general funding being used on the golf course? There is a golf course fund that goes to pay for it and that um, funding goes into. I don't, are you familiar with where, if it's an actual balance sheet balance? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not completely familiar with how much of the revenues actually fund clearly there's a deficit which is why there's an RFP process right now to try to okay. make up that to come up with a long-term strategy for redoing and then maintaining the golf course over time um, and I, I should that's, find that's those meetings answer. and email them to you just so they're on your radar too to watch um, there's a special meeting coming up I'll try to get it by the end of the meeting to tell you thanks and if you do go to the capital budget that's currently approved, you can, uh, I, I don't off the top of my head know, but that budget does have how the expenses and revenues relate to each other. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. No, we don't go backwards. No? No. <laughs> of course we, we do. We <laughs> <laughs> I started at Z. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Zeller. So I just have a question that Mr. Snyder brought up about the golf course renovation, and particularly the Delray Golf Course, um, which there's some proposal to um, sell off a big piece of it. Is this? 
So there. That's yes. that's there's what a, there's public hearings about. What it what. Right. There, Anthea there is are going two to more public us. meetings scheduled. There was one this past weekend at, um, or this past weekend. I don't even know what day. Friday. Uh, yep. Friday. <laughs> I feel right. like it was the weekend, right? It was. It was at the um, field house. At the field yeah. house. There's another one um, Thursday uh, evening and another one Saturday morning. Um, I don't want to confuse you with the dates, so I'll be sure to look them up quickly and then, fill, and then confirm which one's at Lavers Swim and Tennis and which one is at golf course but I can get that for you shortly thank you Anthea that was in that's been in here for a while What's been in here? renovation of the golf course. correct it's about how to There's fund an it active RFP right. a lot which of is why I'm getting I, which is why they're sending you the information for the there's two community meetings this week mr. Zeller on on the various proposals for the golf course. I forget, there's four or five various proposals after the city put out an RFP. I understand. So it has nothing to do with the nope. capital improvement. Right. Nope, has nothing Which to do with it. you already know there's a lot of stuff in the capital improvement plan that is there, but. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. If the money would just fall into right. somebody's lap, that'd be great. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Brown. No comments from Mr. Brown. Ms. Blankenship? Just a couple. I wish Missy was here, but she is not. Um, I just have some qu a question mainly about the current capital improvement projects that are in process um, and the status of them. I know that Missy at one point was giving a regular updates to the City Commission, but I haven't heard her give one of those in a while. And my main concern is the Atlantic Dunes seawall project that seemed to be stalled. Um, do you guys have an update on that or? We'll get one for you for the next meeting. We don't. That's fine. Um, and will Missy be here for the next that, that meeting? Usually she's here. For I'm sure if Missy's not, I'm sure Cynthia uh, Boisson or somebody else can come and provide an update if Missy's not available. Okay, so if that, and could she prov also provide an update on any um, oh, or capital provided, improvement right. projects that are in process right now and like where they are? Well, as part of the CIP, yes. then these discussions will happen. I just, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure what's there and provide updates. It's part of this entire budget process that we're opening that will go through through April. Mm -hmm. So at the end, um, if not the next meeting in May, uh, it would be the, usually public works comes. And so they'll be able to um, provide updates on what's in there and the status as we collect specific suggestions. And just for the record, the CIP is for projects that cost $25,000 or more. So some of the general maintenance complaints that we get every year, things like I can't see the sidewalk stripe or the striping for the lanes or the street light is out, we still take that. We write it all down because we can get it to the right people as part of this. But you know, the CIP is really for those larger construction projects that, that cost you know, a significant amount of money. And so the, the, the base is 25000 and up. It goes into that CIP. And then my next one would just be the um, road, Lake Ida Road itself needs to be repaved, I would say, from Swinton all the way probably to military, uh, definitely around the Barwick um, Park area. Um, it's really difficult to get down that road. And that's all I can think of at the moment. Great. Thank you. Ms. Blankenship, I'm going to come back to Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Anthea, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, it's a redevelopment question. Okay. Uh, you ever coordinate on your capital improvements? Capital improvements are a big tool, mm -hmm. toolbox for CRAs mm -hmm. in redevelopment. Do you ever coordinate with your CRA as to what would be useful? If they can't fund it, then you could fund it. We, we do. As part of this process, we do meet with the CRA uh, director, Renee Jadu Singh, and there are certain projects like the Pompeii Park improvements, which are CRA funded. So, so there, well, there they is can't that. spend money on parks now. I'm not going to comment on <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> whatever. It's a building? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Infrastructure they can, but that's right. So at any rate, there's um, the different street that, you know, it, there's a meeting that happens that includes them in terms of their redevelopment plan goals and the city's needs, and, and they are part of the planning strategy. In the capital improvements budget that's adopted as part of the comp plan, we update that yearly. And so the budget that you'd see if you go to the city's website 
has uh, it specified which projects are CRA funded versus which are coming from city general funds. So you'll be able to find that comprehensive listing there as well. There, the CRAs are prohibited spending money yeah. if it's in your well, CIP. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ms. Morrison? Um, sure. So Palm Bay Park is, is, has a rebuilding um, item in here for 40 some million. And there's also a renovation plan for it. So shouldn't that be all in one? Why are we renovating if it's going to be replaced? Pompe Park, there's a $935,000 item for repairs and then a $40 million item to replace. So we'll put that on the list to have that addressed too with um, Public Works and the, all of the things. That's what was adopted last year. So I, I can't speak to what the commission approved last year. We, I need to stop for a second with Kelly because the meeting is not streaming. So I think I'm trying to reach Lynn really quickly okay. to see if we need to stop because the public can't see us, or what do we do? We probably hold on. Just take a recess. Yeah. can we Let's take, take a, a brief recess? recess? Let's, Let's take a recess for five a minutes. I'm sorry, Christy. I'll try nope. to get your answer to you. No problem. The break. Let the record <laughs> show it's 5:23 p.m. We're going to recess for five minutes and hope to fix the IT problems. Okay, hang on just a second.
Record show, reconvening the city of Delray Beach planning and zoning meeting, and let the record show it is 5:28 p.m. And uh, we've been told that the if anybody is watching, hopefully they're watching it via YouTube where it is screening streaming. Excuse me. Let me apologize to my colleague, Ms. Morrison. Um, she was in the middle of asking a question when we were interrupted. Um, so, excuse me, Ms. Morrison, please ask away. <laughs> okay, so the first item concerned the Pompeii Park rebuilding and, re and repairs as two separate line items. I'm, wonder I'm wondering if why we're repairing if we're gonna rebuild it. Um, wayfaring signage, this has been on the agenda for a long time, and it's supposed to be done in 22, 23. Have, have they been ordered? Are we at least on the way to getting it done? Do we know? Okay, so um, we can, we will bring you back all of these questions and what you are specifically interested in the CIP. Um, the Pompeii Park 925,000 was a legislative appropriation that we received to improve the commercial equipment equipment uh, commercial kitchen equipment that will be moved into the new community center so it's not wasted money it is actually um, going to be uh, used and moved in the new building great 935 excuse me thank you um, on um, the golf course included in the water plant number of a million uh, 132 million does that include the pipes underneath the golf course that apparently have issues with the plumbing? The raw water transmission lines are part of the um, P3, not RFP, it is a P3 that is currently active. Oh, so the repair of those pipes isn't included in the 132 million for the water? I, I will have to bring somebody who can answer that. We'll get someone from utilities here for that. Okay. And seawalls, um, are there about three years ago, there were public hearings about raising all the seawalls, and I didn't see this that in this um, CIP. Has that been put on a side agenda or being handled elsewhere? Or? When we did the amendments to the city ordinances about the height for seawalls and what was required, is that what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, that that was establishing the new code requirements. So, and so, yeah, we were not, uh, it was, yeah, establishing the standards, as Anthea said, so that any new city seawalls will be built to that height, and then any of the privately funded repairs over that certain threshold would be subject to that new height. Oh, so not all the walls are going to be raised. It's just when, if they're being... When they're... When they're gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, veterans Park issues, are they all being handled by the developer of Atlantic Crossing of the... The roadway's horrible, the parking's horrible. It's just a, a, a mess in that whole area right now. Um, and that isn't included anywhere here. I'm wondering if that's being addressed by the developer of Atlantic Crossing or what? I don't think there's a permanent answer yet. They had requested ability to use some of Veterans Park parking. The commission was open to that concept, but an agreement will come back with a more detailed plan, and that hasn't happened just yet, but that should be able to provide okay. you know, more information. Okay. Um, Germantown Avenue, um, there's improvements noted in here. Would that include the repaving of that street? Because it's still really, really bumpy. It's really a mess. It says bike lanes and green area, but it didn't say anything about repaving it. I think that's a FDOT grant situation. Uh, Again, I think we were just opening the discussion, yes. and so we're yeah. writing the topics down. Staff yeah. isn't prepared to respond to each and every comment yes, at this course. point. So, okay. no, understandably, Anthea. And, and just for Christina's knowledge, there is a, they just had their first public meeting about the road, Old Germantown Roads Project, and I think they're having another one. I'll send you the, um, there's a website, oldgermantownroadimprovement.com or something like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't know. Cool. On the city website? No, it sounds, I think it's from FDOT. Oh, okay. Um, and the last item concerns um, alleyways um, renovations to be used for bikes and walkways sometime in the future to try to take some of the bike traffic off of the busy highways where it's dangerous. Thank you very much. Ms. Howell? Um, <clears throat> well, just a minor question. I saw the improvements on Swinton. There's some really deep 
dips in Swinton, especially in the northern part of it. And the improvement isn't slated to be completed there till 2024. I'm just wondering, is there some way to do a patch or something on some of the deep dips? I mean, we've got golf carts that are hitting those dips and just going flying. I don't think, I think it's a safety issue myself. Just wondering. Okay, that's a minor point. I want to go into the tree program. And I don't know if you guys can answer these things or not. Maybe we need to have another meeting of, no, what, with some of these. But They're going to bring the yeah. answers back to us. So yeah. if you have a question, Okay, so 10,000 trees in five years, and that's only on public property, I understand. Is that right? That's my understanding. So what is the current balance in the tree fund right now? They're not prepared to answer questions right. tonight. Right, you're okay, just so asking. I'm, yeah, I'm right. giving you the questions, okay? Right. Um, so I wanna know the current balance. I see that the appropriation here is 325,000, which with 10,000 trees, does that include all 10,000 trees is my first question. And if so, then it's like $32 a tree or something. So I guess what I'm wondering is, we. this is a great program. I'm so glad to see you guys doing it. I just, feel like that we are losing our tree canopy rapidly and the replanting program is not anywhere near what we need and i'm wondering i know from previous conversations that the the one of the stumbling blocks is how do you get trees on private property because that's one of the things it seems like we need to do we just don't have enough public property to get replace our tree canopy even with our 10,000 trees at least that's my understanding so I'm wondering, is there any pilot program where cities have gone out and, and actually had some sort of an incentive program for owners not to take down trees, number one, and number two, any way to use any funds where you could get the trees planted on private property? I know that's sticky, but is there any way to do it? I just, you know, we, this comes up all the time. We're about to lose a huge, beautiful banyan tree in Palm Trail, and the neighbors are just sick about it. They've paid into the tree fund, but that doesn't really help anything. The problem is those dollars won't come back to Palm Trail. They'll be spent wherever we can find public property to put the trees on. There, there's got to be a better solution, you guys. So my, my question would be, could we delve into this a little bit more whenever you get back to Ken Edwards or whoever is doing it? That's it. You got it. Can I, before you go, can I just say one Please, more thing? Absolutely. Um, since we're taking notes for next meeting, um, as part of the uh, Homewood Boulevard Improvement Complete Street, um, there was a lot of tree. I'm gonna say a lot. I would say probably four mahogany trees and several um, black olive trees removed, and they were, and some slash pines, and they were supposed to be replaced. And I understand it's a smaller tree, but I have I don't know if we. I just don't want to lose that those trees. I don't want FDOT to you know somehow not be for, required to replace them. So I just want to make sure we're staying on top of of that. Okay. Thank you. And can we email, who should we email if we come up with something before the meeting? Should we do PZ mail or would you, uh, us like? If you want them, if you want them formally submitted in the comments, then you could send it to the PZ mail. But if you have other questions that you'd like us to add. As to a board member? To address, yeah. yeah. As, yeah as, a as a board member, send it to Rebecca. But to you, though. To Rebecca. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I have nothing to add, so <laughs> thank you guys, <laughs> really. <laughs> So, that being said, uh, we can move on to item number 7B. Gentlemen in the first row, moving on to your item, number 7B, artificial turf. Okay. Yeah. Sir. All right. Uh, good evening. My name is David Glover. I'm the city senior landscape um, planner. Uh, to, uh, staff would like to present agenda item now 7B, Artificial Turf, LDR Amendment, Ordinance Number 11-23. The reason staff is proposing the amendment is due to the overwhelming demand for artificial turf. Currently, artificial turf is not defined or prohibited by our LDRs. On a limited basis, artificial has been approved on an extension of Hartscape. 
Historic currently has regu regulations restricting residents from altering buildings on site features not consistent with the overall historic character. And here are some of the um, other cities historic LDR staff has been researching. Um, this is just a brief description of some of the environmental impacts staff would like uh, committed to take for consideration. Subsection E, staff is proposing cleanup to some of the current language for landscape minimum requirements, uh, but with no changes. In section 12 is the proposal for the artificial turf amendment. And in section H, uh, it reduces the square footage treat requirement for single family homes and provides more cleanup language for the minimum standards, but with also no changes. Uh, this is staff's defi definition for artificial turf and adding artificial turf to the hardscape definition. And so at this time, this is our first draft and we would like for the committee to provide us a little feedback to see if staff is too strict, just right, or we need to provide a little more provisions. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I'll now open it up, I guess. We've heard the city's presentation, public comment. Okay, sir, this, now is your time. You got three minutes, so please come on up. This and is my first time ever showing up to one of these things, so I'm very nervous, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. If you could state your name and address again um, for the record. Yes, my name is Kong Lim. I, my property address is 912 East Street uh, in Delray Beach in the Tropic Isle. Okay, and I prepare our speech too, so I don't mess up. Okay. okay. Uh, so to thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, um, for allowing me to be here to speak to you. Uh, I'd like to request that the board members postpone our voting the proposed amendment until further review. The proposed amendment is arbitrary, difficult to interpret, and does not make sense mathematically, and the citizens were not informed. Uh, furthermore, the two supporting documents are not helpful in this case. Document one was written on May 8 of 2019 by Sonia Mirick from NRP.org, which is three years old and talks about recreational fields. Uh, sec the second document was written on July 9, 2021, by Harry Sawyers and Greg A. Hahn, which is two years old and talks about pros and cons of having artificial turf with focus on cost. Okay, none of those applies to our community. Um, the, proposal, uh, the proposed amendment of the LDR, particularly in sections 4616E and 4616H, use the language in a way that it will make it impossible to use artificial turf. It does not clearly describe how artificial turf should be used, and I would like to submit uh, Exhibit 6. Um, do I get that to you, Diane? Thank you. Oh, I have only one copy, because I have a lot of exhibits to show you. Uh, That's fine. Thank you, sir. If you can give that, Diane can enter it into the record for us. Okay. Can I hand you the whole packet, and I just refer to them? In, in order, I have it in order. Okay, so today, um, the proposed amendment seems to be a direct result of my line of questions to the senior landscape planner, David Glover, about the regulations regarding the artificial turf. I would like to submit the following exhibits, and the next exhibit um, is 1A. And it's an email that I sent to the city's assistant attorney, William Bennett, describing the timeline of events that occurred after Mr. Glover and I were not able to get clarification on the regulations. Uh, next exhibit is Exhibit 1B, and that is the 25% open space survey and calculation that the permit managers got paid requested. I think, uh, honestly, as, as far as your comment, it should right. really be addressed toward the specific regulation that's in front of them as opposed to the specific dealings with your property. Oh, no, so so these, um, these actually, it, what the, the regulations that are in place today is a direct um, the rec, uh, events that happen strictly from, from all of this. That's why I'm supporting, uh, using this exhibit to show where the 
uh, regulation was derived. Okay. Okay. That's why it, I'm submitting to proof to show that it is related. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. All right. Kelly, I'll, I'll let him speak about this just because if he's using his own property as an example, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. He's not here complaining about it. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Um, and then Exhibit 1C, and that's uh, is the violation notice that I received and other homeowners received the exact same notice, um, including one home which already has a permit. Okay. Um, and he is here today. And in conclusion, I would like to request that the implementation of a vague, non-specific statute without the mention of artificial turf not be involved to make homeowners on E Street remove our existing to artificial turf or require us to attain a permit. The artificial turf is serving its purpose as a low maintenance lawn without wasting water, without the use of cancer causing pesticides and without the use of air polluting gasoline. When it's at its end of life, there are now programs being developed properly and safely recycling the materials instead of disposing in landfills. And I have exhibit, um, exhibit uh, two to uh, five showing the private organizations that are putting effort into re recycling these materials. Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Willem. Have a good evening. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this item? Please come forth and state your name and address for the record. My name is Rocco Onofrito. I live at 942 Eve Street, Delray Beach, uh, right down the street from this gentleman. Um, uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I, was, I received a violation for my artificial grass. Just to give you a little bit of background here, uh, four years ago, I went for a permit for my home to replace my asphalt driveway. At the time of replacing the driveway, I wanted to put a couple of pillars out in front with lights, and I wanted to do artificial grass. I've been there for almost 14 years, replaced the grass twice already, and it was just always weeds, pesticides, maintenance, a lot of watering, and just never worked. It was never really good looking front of my home. I went to the city, spoke to Steve Tobias, head of building. I said, what exactly do I need to get my permit? I want to go right by the book. I don't want to do anything the wrong way. And he said to me, I do need some uh, structural. I need engineering drawings for the pillars. Uh, and uh, he said, you may speak to landscaping also, which I did. I have a copy of my permit here, a copy of my permit. And it's a color-coded copy of what I was getting done at the time. I was getting the driveway replaced, ripping out the asphalt, new concrete. In red is the four pillars with lights, and you clearly see that the green part is the artificial grass right there. At the time, I went to the landscaping department and spoke to a gentleman. I don't have his last name, but I spoke to this gentleman last week. His name is Bill. He was in charge of landscaping. Excuse me. Hey. Sir, I, I just gave you the same direction that I gave him. You know, your, your comments should be directed to the LDR change that they're putting forward as opposed to your specific. Um, Here's what I'm going to ask you, sir. Let me put it to you this way. Have you read the proposed ordinance this evening? I spoke to, I was just informed about this meeting actually a few hours ago. Okay. Okay, that's number one. Okay. Number two, when I spoke to this gentleman, I have and to I, say. I would just, if, if you can just refer to city staff as just city staff in general. We, we, don't, we don't talk about what? specific people in the. But I spoke to this gentleman right here. Yes, it's part okay. of our rules that okay. we speak of city staff in general. So. When I spoke to the city staff last week and came here to see what was going on with my violation for my home, which I was told by this gentleman, I have to rip it out or I will be in violation for $1,000 a day. Excuse me. Um, okay. If, sir, yeah. excuse me. Let me take care of this. Um, sir. First of all, I understand you're upset about this. Very upset, to say the least, because I was Understood. told I couldn't get a permit. There was no permit available for artificial grass. Can I just, can I just tell you something? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Fine. This is a meeting of the Planning and Zoning Board of the City of Delray Beach. Okay, what we're, The item we're hearing right now 
okay, is a legislative item because the city is looking to alter its code regarding artificial turf. Okay. So what I'm going to say is that, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you to limit your comments to something that has to do with the item before us. That's why at the beginning of the meeting, I asked the question, is there anybody here to speak? You want to speak about your personal situation, not the item that's on our well, agenda. Not just that, though, sir, because in the last hour just before this meeting, I drove around the city. And not only did I drive around Tropic Isle to see about the situation, but I drove around quite a few different homes. I have addresses and addresses sir. of homes with that. Can I tell you? But, but let, let me just finish here. No, because sir, sir, sir. Your, your comments have to be relevant to the LTV to the item. We're, we're looking at, and that's why you were called up for this item. I understand that you're upset. The things that you're dealing with with code, that's a different board. That, that doesn't come to this. Board. Right. So it, you guys can have this meeting and change rules and regulations? No, sir, we're not. We're an advisory board here. Okay. Okay? We're not implementing anything. In fact, I wanted to correct Mr. Lim, but I didn't want to. He referred to us as mayor and commissioners. No. Mm -hmm. We are all volunteers here on the planning and zoning board of the city of Delray Beach. What our job is is to listen to what city staff is and make recommendations to them, okay, with public input. I Believe me, I empathize with your situation, but I'm just saying that this board and this particular format is not the forum for you to bring this to. What would be the forum Which, for me to bring forum it Forum for you to bring it to would be the Code Enforcement Board. Or the okay. City Commission. Or the City Commission. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Either the Thank City you. Commission or At the, or least the Code I'm Enforcement. I'm getting some guidance here because okay. I didn't even know about this meeting until a couple hours ago. Right. And I am upset. I'm just, I, I am honestly. Understandably, but I'm just upset. letting you know this meeting was publicly noticed 10 days ago. Okay. And we have three items that are on the agenda. We're normally not even sitting in this fashion here, mm -hmm. but because most of our items, we're not hearing actual people's proposals tonight. We're hearing legislative items and other informational items. Uh, okay. I, and I understand, and I'm in front of the wrong board then, I guess. But, well, but Yes, but totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> really sir, upset. Sir, I'm going gonna, gonna to ask that if you have any more questions, you might follow up with staff later or come back to the Code Enforcement yeah. Board or the Commission. What I would tell you, sir, I, um, I literally, just contact Code Enforcement Department first thing in the morning. Okay. Okay? Very good. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Davey, if Sorry I can that. offer a little bit of clarification that might, Please. might help. Um, so when we establish land development regulations, and I, can, I think this is a perfect example as to why we're here, right? We need mm -hmm. to have quantitative, measurable, clear directions that doesn't matter who the senior landscape planner is or who the building official is or who the development services director right. is everybody understands the rules and and this is what we're struggling with right now is that we don't have very clear rules now for our audience members who are dealing with their personal properties um, if 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 something was installed legally before with a permit even if we change the rules that doesn't necessarily force you to change your property. Exactly. So this is trying to establish what the rules should be for artificial turf moving forward. Going forward and for Clearly. people who did not get <laughs> permission mean, in the past. Whether, whether they did or they didn't is not right. at issue. It's just at this point we're this trying is going to come forward. up with something clear and measurable for everyone because we are getting a lot of... Um, demand for it and it goes in without permits sometimes and perhaps it's gone in with permits in the past but that's why this is here thank you thank you anthea miss fence yes alice fence um 707 place to delray beach 33445 um in one of my life circles i am a former president present and future master gardener I have never been to any training program at the mounts or for the master gardeners on using artificial things in your yard and maybe a, a bird bath is sort of artificial, but that attracts birds and, um, and people. But um, even to bring this up, 
other than to say no before you even get into the conversation. Just doesn't seem like this is something this board should even be discussing. And maybe before it goes any further, you can just say no, bye-bye, see you someplace else. Thanks, Alice. <laughs> what? Well, let's just, excuse me, sir. She has the opportunity, like everybody else, to comment. Yes, Ms. Finst. So um, we don't want to be breathing the fumes from artificial things in our yards. And let's stop it here. Thank you, Ms. Finst. Ms. Dasri, do you have a comment? No? Uh, I just wanted to say, um, we started officially taking notes on this to have an official department interpretation at least as far back as November of 2022. And then, um, that's when we started to formally draft these regulations because it's not fair, like Anthea said, to our planners to have to interpret regulations that are really based on more of the ether of how we feel our code speaks to landscape treatment. And that's why the the, um, the proposal that you have before you, I'm sorry, I forgot which huh? else I'm working with here. So we- We'll, we'll recognize you. Just we defined it as hardscape specifically because um, while it may be a part of a landscape treatment, it is not a natural part of it, and that's what right. the landscape regulations speak to. So um, it is, um, we are recognizing, again, we have a number of owners that want this to be part of their landscape treatment. Mm -hmm. But we have um, started with a stab in the dark, and again, this is not for a formal recommendation at this meeting. It is to get this feedback because this is new no matter what direction we sure. take. So I just want to say understandably and it did go to the green board um, earlier this week they were generally in favor of us um, establishing regulations to govern it but beyond that they didn't come down hard either way against or for it good I, I do think miss Smith had a um, public comment on this as well please you have to rise and get in line <laughs> thank my you my name is Maureen Smith uh, I live at 968 Dogwood Drive and I'm also a landscape architect sure. I deal with this is my life I deal with this every day. Homeowners that love it, are intrigued by it, want to know more. I think the city needs to know a little more, do a little more background, you know, a um, little more research on the benefits because while there's a lot of um, negative impact, untrue truths that I'm reading on this note, there's a lot of really good um, use, reasons why you should use it. Number one, the homeowner doesn't have to stop their irrigation system for from being installed. They can tap off and close off the heads that treat the areas where the grass is. The grass looks great in the winter time when a lot of people will have zoysia, the grass turns brown, it gets weedy in the winter time. The only time it looks really good, the zoysia, the, the choice that a lot of people are using. If there's any shade around those trees in the winter time because the sun is further south in the sky, and if you have a house that faces north like mine, and I have an oak tree, the grass isn't growing underneath. It says in here that I can't put my synthetic grass under the drip line of my, my oak tree. So you guys would rather see, or the city would rather see dirt and leaves and debris than green grass that looks great year in and year out. I mean, it really, I, 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 was, I gave an oath, I'm a tree hugger, to love everything real and growing, and it's, easy for me to see the positive side of the turf it doesn't it doesn't give off uh, toxic fumes that's a misnomer number two they don't have to fertilize it so when your kids are out there playing and rolling around in the grass they're not they're not rolling into the, the fertilizers we don't even know what's in them that they're they're selling us more than what we need it doesn't have to be watered so they can close off all those areas that are, are turf with capping them, just they don't run because you close off, you don't put the head on, you put a cap on instead of the head, the rotating head, you turn the water off. So it's water savings, it's no fertilizer. We're not putting fertilizer that seeps down into our water system, our, our aquifer. It's not going back into our, the drinking water eventually and going underground and spreading sideways and, and contaminating a lot of stuff. These are the things that the city really needs to look at before they come up with a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, because um, there's 20 
counters to this list. And I, I'm not trying to try not try not I'm not trying not to be harsh, but I can see why so many people want to use it. In my neighborhood, they're charging four hundred dollars to mow your lawn now. Who pays that? Well, we do, just because of the address. Even though our yards are ninety by a hundred. Why? Because we you know, a lot of people are building fancy houses in there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're paying three times what everybody else pays. And unless you want to go out there and do it yourself, you're kind of a captive audience. So with the opportunity to do the synthetic grass, we get to pull back a little bit of our finance and say, I'm still in control of the kind of money I'm spending on landscaping. Okay. Ms. Smith, you're at the three minute mark. Thank you. Okay, well, oh, all right. There's, there's probably about eight out of this list that really needs to take a, you know, better. and I'm more than happy to, to, to send you guys brochures and uh, help you out. And please, if you have any information, because I think there's in. there's really a lot of benefit for it, especially for health. Okay. Our health. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and the engineer is development services director. I think perhaps there's. Um, a misunderstanding as to why we're here. We're actually right. here to workshop this issue. Nothing is being done to anyone right. at this thing. So the comments that I'm getting, and I would ask, I'll actually give you my copy of the draft, Ms. Ms. A landscape architect's input I think would be really valuable, and we'll be um, circulating these as well, that um, right now allowing it under the drip line of a tree is her comment as opposed to what's sure. drafted here now. Um, and that uh, I'm trying to get back into this that uh, we don't you don't have to change irrigation to have it should it be installed then in the that it might be a lawn at some point there are things like that we have to think about when we're issuing permits so this is it's very useful these types of comments to us as well um, and it's exactly why we're having this workshop so anything anyone else is concerned about it is creeping into the city and we need to understand whether it's desirable or not sure um let me turn to my colleagues. I'll start, it. Mr. Zeller, I started with you earlier. Ms. Morrison, it's bouncing over to you first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a little bit of history with this because uh, the putting green in our backyard is artificial turf. I didn't tell you, but it is. Um, and the only issue that we have is that um, it always looks beautiful, by the way. It always looks beautiful. You don't have to water it, but it does get mildew occasionally and it doesn't have to be scrubbed out um, once a year. But other than that, it, it has a lot of aesthetic appeal and, um, may, and, and also it doesn't need to be watered. So we'd be saving water, which is a big issue in Florida. I know we're surrounded by water, but when we go to Tallahassee, we hear that we're running out of water. So um, we might want to um, consider that aspect also. Thank you. Sal? Um, I don't really have anything. Thanks. Okay. No problem. Ms. Blankenship? Ms. Dossery, hi. Um, just my comment is that the, respectfully, their presentation by the city was really fast, went really, by, really fast to me. And if we could just go back to the slide about the language that's being introduced um, and just kind of like, I mean, I'm not go, asking you to go back through the whole thing, but just kind of give me a highlight of the differences that you're proposing. Was the artificial turf um, part of the uh, ordinance as it's written or wasn't there at all? So this is all new language, right? Okay. So, yeah, to give the board some clarity, as the current LDR stands today, all services on a pervious lot without a structure or walkway or driveway has to be a natural plant material. So, in reality, this amendment would allow for artificial turf. We're just asking and trying to get feedback on uh, how to limit it or what percentage or or how staff should proceed that way. Because currently, a single family homeowner cannot provide artificial turf at all. Okay, and so the um, research that you showed on the one slide from the other cities is just um, giving you some feedback about what other cities are doing um, in terms of. Yes, so we specifically did that research related to historic properties. Our historic division did that. Mm -hmm. and we're finding that most um, jurisdictions do not allow it on historic properties at all. Some may allow it in the backyard, like for a recreational element. So that's why we wrote it a little more strict for anything that's deemed historic. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be getting their formal feedback at their April meeting before we bring a final draft back to this board. But uh, a lot of those... Um, came from jurisdictions that had the regulations, whereas a lot of 
um, jurisdictions have been slow to adopt, even though um, like through the local intergovernmental committees, they're all asking how people handle artificial turf because no one really has regs unless they've specifically adopted it for, or a lot of jurisdictions don't have it unless they've adopted it specific to historic. And I think um, if we can go back to an earlier slide as well, this shows um, how we've kind of backdoored into the interpretation we've been using. Mm -hmm. So again, um, it's not specifically defined in the LDR as has been discussed, but um, engineering doesn't allow it in the right of ways. So that's why I think we, we went ahead and just limited it in the front yards. They, they don't think it's safe. Um, in, in the right of way in case a car slips off the road. So that's where the restriction on front yards comes from. And then with the 25% open space requirement, it has to be the natural material. And so with artificial turf not being consider considered natural area, artificial turf by default couldn't go in that area. And then we have the other um, requirements about percentages of grass, 70% um, of a residential lot maximum can be artificial turf, sorry, be lawn grass, and then the rest would need to be different planting. So maybe under a tree, instead of putting artificial turf, you could put a different kind of planting. So different ways to look at how you could treat it um, is, is really how we approached it. Um, with these being the guiding principles that you see on the screen in front of you to really how we got where we got. Um, but again, if board wants to allow it in front yards, then we could take that direction. Um, but this was our starting point to codify where we are now with our departmental interpretation. OK, and I, I'm not sure if you're able to, I'm not sure if you even know what happened at the green board meeting, if you're you know, uh, privy to that. But do you know any of the comments that the, the green board had? Was it generally favorable? I know you mentioned it. Was it generally favorable? Or did uh, yes, they it show was concern? Generally favorable. They made, uh, they made a comment about uh, adding biodegradable into the um, amendment. Um, but majority they was in favor for it. They actually was proposing a setback requirement instead of the 15%. Okay, and I'm, I'm admittedly, I'm not I'm up on uh, artificial turf, and so I'm not unsure if there are different products on the market that are Many. of different materials, and so would the city be regulating the materials that would possibly be used for that? Well, I might yeah, have missed um, it in the I'll ordinance. go back to the slide. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if, you, if you can look at this slide, in this um, section 12, it provides some provisions of what the city will ask for. Um, just like uh, we ask that it be designed to be permittable, um, 30 inches per hour. We ask for it to be lead free, recyclable, disposable at a landfill station. Uh, we also ask for it to have an eight year warranty. Okay. And since this is just a workshop sort of uh, discussion, I can send my comments. You know, after I look yes. over to you, would I send them to yes, you? Yes, that'll be fine. Okay, and thank you so much. Yes, you'll sir. see under 12B, there's a requirement for it to be installed no closer than five feet of the property line. One of the comments that we get quite a bit is is that well, you can't pave all the way to the property line because, and honestly, these some of those rules that people are used to seeing building happen, they're because of comments related to drainage. They're actually that that five feet doesn't always exist in the code the way a lot of our residents think it does. Yep. And so this is where we're trying to go through and find those. And so sure enough, you know, this is another concern that they that we want it five feet in so that there's natural plant material around the edges, which also helps keep runoff from running between Lots. adjacent units. So there's things like that that public comment yeah. is closed. Then I saw that it was um percentage to be permeable. Public comment is, Smith? is closed at this point. Is Smith Public comment is closed I'm, at this I'm point. I'm so sorry. No, yeah. no, there is no sorry. Look up formulation. Thank you. Please sit down. Yes. Um, I saw that there was permeability also uh, ordinance, so that would I would I would assume would mitigate any kind of um, water issues or well, drainage I, onto the uh, property. You know, drainage issues. Right. Well, so we're looking at those, and I'll, I'll turn it to David. But the other, you know, the, the reality is, you know, some of the speakers are right. You know, lawn is not the most environmentally or water conscious solution either. Just right. look at California. Yeah, exactly. So right. we're trying to find the balance between. <laughs> sure. Um, well, on the five foot. No, I think you covered. But yeah, um, 
with some of the new home builds today, you know, there's required drainage in these five foot uh, setbacks. So that's why we're asking that you would not be able to install artificial turf in the first five feet of the setback. And, I, and just as an opinion, would you think that the 15 foot that um, the green board um, suggested is overkill or is un unneeded and five foot is sufficient? Um, well, it would be in addition to the five foot on the sides. Um, they was proposing uh, maybe a 40 to 50 foot setback from the from all right of ways and swells. Okay. For artificial turf. Yes. 40 to 50 feet. All right. And then I, I guess my last comment, yeah. and thank you for <laughs> indulging me, would be um, code enforcement. So I'm not sure how much that artificial turf looks like grass. Um, I know that it doesn't in the, in the winter. Let's just say. Um, hmm. So would that be a code enforcement issue where if the, somebody thought that people were just installing artificial turf without a permit, then they would just call code enforcement? Yeah. That uh, would work yeah. in the future? Yeah. Any landscape um, improvement over $1,000 requires a permit. Okay. And listen, I, I'm for it. You know, as much as we can make it really um, explicit what we want in the code, they're all better for us. So. Definitely. Thank you so much. Mr. Brown? It's a real, it's a very interesting subject, and I do agree entirely with the city staff that that artificial turf should be considered hardscape. I've been involved in two park projects in the city of Pompano, and we used it for for areas for people to do yoga, for example. It worked very well. One on the beach, and one in an urban, even in an urban park, where they can sit down, bring their family, and have a lunch in the artificial turf. You can't see it. One of the urban park, you can't see it from the street, but the but you can definitely see it from the street on the ocean uh, yoga mat. It's a very, very large yoga mat. However, because we have in Delray, and I've recently built a house, I know what the drainage requirements are, and the five, the five foot rule is so that you have to do a swale at the edge of your every public street, and you can't have an impervious product there. So that's, that's that. I do agree with someone like Mrs. Morrison in her backyard. I've seen it many times. It's a great play area for kids, particularly. So I think we need to find some language and compromise to allow people to do it. And here's the last comment. There's always exception to every rule. And I bet you a million dollars, Anthea, that if you were to have a fantastic landscape architect do gazebo with gazebo with plants surrounding gazebo or plants surrounding a particular area and it was artificial glass grass you would like it so maybe you want to have some exception of exceptional design and not rule out creativity it's the only thing i ask you because creativity can be ruled out by rules so it's something to consider and you would have to bring it before Probably not this board for approval, but probably the site plan and appearance board. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Snyder? Yeah, I really don't have much to say. I um, applaud this effort to codify this. I think it's really important, and I think it's pretty reasonable. My really only comment was, I think it's been answered. When I read this, when you compare the different cities, only in Orlando does it say a permit is required. But from what I'm hearing from the staff is, in Delray Beach, a permit is required already if you want to put this in. Is that correct? Not now. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> uh, Not a present. <laughs> well, man, I don't understand what was said, please. Well, the current LDR states if you're doing a landscape improvement over $1,000, it requires a permit. Okay. So this would cost over $1,000. Well, I would still suggest that that be included in the ordinance. And beyond that, I put my colleagues have made a lot of pertinent comments. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Mr. Zeller? Yes. <clears throat> I think it's a good idea to have the ordinance uh, contain issues of about the artificial turf because it is getting to be more prevalent. I think there should be a, sp a specification that it should have a permit. I think um, there should also be some educational pro 
um, component for landscapers because landscapers push this stuff pretty heavily. Um, and people say, okay, you know, that mulch isn't working, whatever, stick in some artificial turf. And nobody thinks twice about it, whether it's $1,000 or not. Um, if we're doing a, an ordinance, it, it's a good idea to put it in there as well, even if it is a little redundant. Um, I think it's an excellent idea to not count artificial turf as open space because I think that's a mistake. I have a question about the five feet uh, to the property line. Um, is that side yards and back yards as well? Yes. Just the front yard? Side and back. Okay, so what happens with like the zero lot lines on the side yards? They couldn't even put artificial turf in there because it probably isn't much more than five feet to begin with. And maybe well, that. This, um, my colleague's suggestion about an exception if. Uh, know if it can be accommodated um yes that language came from the engineering department but that is a, something that staff can take in consideration and look at that's something i think that you should look at very good point mr zeller i definitely agree that it uh should be prohibited uh from the right of way um because i think that's that's critical as well um i think Mm. since you drew it to our attention and it's not really in here but in, in this section H on um, page 7 where it says I like the idea that one tree one shade tree should be planted for every 2,000 square feet rather than 2,500 I think that's important um, with a minimum of three trees or single lot, some criteria like that. What I don't like is in here that's really not part of the um, artificial turf is like on page four where they say coconut palms and royal palms can be credited on a one-for-one -one basis with shade trees. I don't think palms should be credited as shade trees to begin with. I mean, they don't shade and everybody's I don't know maybe it's a cost factor I don't know anything uh, and the jury's out on whether they were really well Mr. Miller <laughs> I think we've talked a lot about updating our tree ordinance and I think that's yeah. what would need to come first is so, but the, you know they talk about it a lot in here we should do something with that. Do something that may be in the update that we brought before you several months ago um when we're talking about tree mitigation it's gotten hung up before commission because we wanted to get a little feedback on some of the issues like that um related to how we allow mitigation or what we require mitigation for like should we require mitigation for a mango tree or only for a hardwood or as long as you meet the landscape minimum should we require if you mit to mitigate over and above that so those are some of the issues that you're pointing out that we we're looking for some feedback on so we can keep that ordinance moving through but we'll absolutely make note of that concern and include it um i will add some on that too because he's he's speaking about coordinating with the uh, one tree for every two thousand square feet so when you see that it says the coconut palms and the royal palms can be credit for one tree that's on the minimum standards of what a single family lot should have so with um, your observation of us dropping to 2,000 square foot, that will require a minimum of three trees. So with the ordinance saying that 50% has to be um, hardwood and not palms, therefore we would get two hardwood trees and one palm, instead of as it's currently written, you would get one tree, one palm. Okay. Well, Good. I think like for <laughs> shade trees, well. <laughs> they should be shade trees, not palm trees particularly when in the, in the front of the house, on, in the right of way or wherever, between the Absolutely. street and the sidewalk or whatever, um, want shade trees, particularly now with the climate change and whatever. Palm trees, coconut palms are a mess anyway. 
and this may end up being split into two ordinances or come be added because it's a single topic ordinance. So we're talking about artificial turf. Sure. However, um, based on all the comments about trees and maintaining trees, and you know, David raised a really good point, which is we, you know, we can raise the minimum standard for what has to go on single family lots. We don't have a lot of regulatory authority over single family lots with tree removal, but um, but this is a small way to try to green the city more on private property. Um, we, we may split it off into a separate ordinance, but you'll, you know, or the one that's already going through with the palms, but. Um, Just one more comment. Yeah. The, um, artificial turf materials must have the following characteristics, and you go and you list a bunch. There's been so much um, that comes out about carcinogenic materials that uh, these artificial turfs and whatever are made of. And I don't know how you can control that or describe it because they keep coming up with more and more stuff that 10 years later that they find to be carcinogenic. Um, it would be nice to have some um, limitations on that, but nobody knows. Now there's just an article about banning forever uh, chemicals in everything or whatever. I don't know if yeah. that will ever get by. Artificial turf is prevalent with carcinogenic, in my view, my limited view of that. I'm not a doctor, I'm not an architect, landscape architect. <laughs> I believe that there are dangers to it. We could look into okay. adding some language that restricts materials if, if I mean, if that's at the pleasure of the board. Um, I think there are some biodegradable products. Um, I mean, if, if you would like us to add some of those restrictions, we could do that. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mr. Brown? I just want to ask one last question to the city staff. You've seen driveways made of concrete with sort of Mondrian patterns of spaces between the concrete, and you've seen turf block, which has open space in their voids. You would allow, because you're considering artificial turf as a hardscape, allow that to be lined with artificial turf. Is it perfect? Have a driveway? I could send you a picture. As long as you're outside of the five foot area yeah. That's and the right of way. What happens when your driveway hits this? Too bad. It's can, over. Can no, it's solid over. concrete <laughs> in the right of way. Yeah. Yeah, staff wood. That, that's what you're yeah. doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Only comment I would have would be um, I think that the city should require in this proposal some sort of minimum level of permeability of a product. Okay? Yeah, I think it's. Um, in the design, I don't know yeah. whether that would be a percentage, a flow rate per square foot. I'm not an expert in this, but my only concern is, I mean, I'm driving around the city all day long. I'm driving around today, I've been watching a house for the past few months, it's a flip. Four guys out there covered the entire front yard with artificial turf today, okay? That so makes, what happens there on a hurricane though? We have water's deluging down. Is right, it, is and I'm just literally, the entire front lawn just became artificial turf today. And you know, I'm just, what I'm saying is, is that it's becoming a bigger issue. It's becoming a bigger issue. And uh, this is taking place on a pretty main road too. So they weren't being bashful about it right in the front yard. But I'm just saying that um, if we are going to allow covering, you know, we have to maintain our water absorption of these lots and that's my biggest concern yes, as long as it's still a permeability factor and the ground can absorb water i think it's a i think it's a product that a lot of people want and it's beneficial in many many ways but that's my only concern i agree can i just make one more comment please so, mr zeller you take that area on i guess the side of the ray hotel they have a big artificial turf area where they do yoga and whatever and it looks really nice I mean you know it's attractive I guess I don't know if you'd call that a front yard or whatever but you know that's where I think it ties in 
uh, to what Mr. Brown said, with exceptions. Some, you know, you right. Who would you go to if you have a situation that doesn't comport with the code, but that makes sense to be able to give somebody leeway? Maybe it'll be Board of Adjustment. I don't know. But as you're analyzing this, I would ask you guys in legal to put your heads together and go, look, if somebody wants a little bit of leeway in these rules, there has to be um, a relief valve for them, so to speak. Whether it's a waiver system or whatever. Right, okay. whether it's a waiver or a variance granted by the Board of Adjustment on this particular site because of a particular issue that's unique to that site and unique to that design, I think is a good idea. Any idea on the timeline for the ordinance to come back before the boards? Um, we were going to bring it back to, or shoot for bringing it back to you guys in April, but mm -hmm. the dates for HPB have moved back because of holidays, so it might bring it back to you in May instead. Um, so either April or May to you guys, but I think probably May we want the HPB input for the historic properties. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Mr. Glover. And thank you. Thank you. And keep moving on. Our next one we roll into would be item 9B. And again, Ms. Dossery. Thank you. Good luck, by the way. Thank you. Okay, so this is an ordinance that uh, we would request a recommendation. Um, so the downtown area is a little bit unique in that um, it has an adopted architecture design guidelines. The book is um, posted online. Um, it uh, uses a categorization of styles and a process based on those styles. You can actually build any style you want in the downtown. It just depends on how it's going to move through the approval process and how many public hearings it's gonna to require to give everybody a chance to provide input. Um, so what's before you now is an adjustment to the current LDRs, Ordinance 1223, um, which would basically require using two of the existing styles, Masonry Modern and Art Deco, uh, to shift to the recommendation via SPRAP or HPB with final approval by the City Commission. So it's sort of raising the uh, level of scrutiny for buildings that opt to use that style. So the book that, uh, the guidelines that we use now um, talk about things like building composition, articulation, balcony, storefronts. The seven styles were identified as being appropriate for downtown based on historical precedent. Uh, the climate that we have and the building scale that the city uses. Um, so for example, we have a main street vernacular building type um, and the book provides guidance that the SPRAB board or the HPB board can use to look at the execution. It provides um, staff with a, uh, a way to have a dialogue with our developers and, and our architects that come through. Um, they are quite broad. So. Um, you know, the, the Mediterranean revival is everything from Mission to the more ornate Meisners. Um, and uh, we have Art Deco. We have a classical tradition. Yep, what could happen someday. Um, masonry Modern. Huh. Um, now, again, like I said, you can use any style that you want, but it is not to be an eclectic mix-up. It's something that should follow the same litmus test. It's appropriate for our city. It meets our climate needs, all of those things. Um, so the way that a new style is approved, it goes to the city commission via approval by SPRAB or HPV. You provide a description, you, a justification, an explanation, and we have had a, a building go through that. The Ray Hotel um, went through that pre-approval to use something that departed from what was generally expected in the downtown area, using corrugated perforated metal panels, using exposed concrete, different things that they were doing, the floating box, in the air rather than a storefront lining the street. These are departures from the way that down, the downtown architecture was defined at the time. They were successful in achieving uh, that, that approval and the building is built today. 
Um, so there has been a concern about the uh, proliferation of the masonry modern type. Um, and there's been other concerns that were raised about the way Art Deco has been executed in the city. Um, you know, the, there was a, a facelift to uh, a building years ago that has the fresh produce store in it that has an Art Deco, um, you know, facade now. There's the, the flossy building with the, um, the um, pharmacy that's there, uh, the Lisa building, and a few others. And a lot of those were done by Delray Beach local architect. Um, however, I think the approval of docs and some others kind of really raised um, some of the concern as to whether or not um, the style was being executed in a manner that, that felt like it was Delray Beach. The DDA did send a letter um, raising concern about the style. So again, you can use any style you want, but perhaps that requires um, a process that gives another public uh, meeting to have um, input and, and ensure uh, that the project you know, is um, great, not just good. So um, we were, there was a workshop in February with the city commission. They directed staff to adjust the LDR, and that's the ordinance that you see before you now. So these are, I'm sorry, I'm like not, I'm completely going out of order now. So here's the fresh produce building. This is the flossy building, and this is the Lisa building. Um, and then Masonry Modern, uh, this is the hotel in the northbound federal that you see. It's uh, simple. This is the Hampton that is coming out of the ground now. It's under construction. Um, and, you know, the SPRAB has also, um, I think, bear in mind that that board sees all development, not just downtown development. And so there is um, some concern about um, sort of an overarching redevelopment, sort of re recasting the, the um, character of the city. Uh, and a concern that whether these choices are more cost effective rather than a true desire to build a contemporary building. Um, so the change before you um, just mirrors that process where if you want to use a different architectural style, it would require city commission approval via recommendation by the SPRAB or HPB um, prior to final action on the site plan. So there would be you know, a presentation that has um, you know, the public review and the commission would have a chance to um, you know, make sure that the building is um, something that um, is built to a Delray Beach standard, and then it would go back for you know the final approval by the by the SPRAB board, um, with the expectation that the design of the building is stays consistent with what was presented to the commission. And so that's the change before you. Um, and of course, we have our LDRs that talk about um, goals regarding um, you know high quality urban form. Um, and, um, you know, enhancing the village by the sea, character of the downtown area, and the areas east of 95. Um, so the action before you now is to either recommend approval, recommend approval with some suggestions on how to change it, or recommend denial um, for the ordinance. Start at this end this time. Mr. Zeller, go ahead. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> I forgot. Absolutely. Thank you. Let me ask, does any member of the public wish to come forth and speak on this item? If they do, please come forward to the podium now. See the voice of reason out there. <laughs> <laughs> Not this item? <laughs> um, seeing no one coming forward, Public comment will be closed, and now I can move on to Mr. Zell. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, it's again, I'm not an architect. It's like the old adage, um, you may not know what to call it, but you know what you like when you see it. <laughs> and it seems to me that, that these developers or architects or whatever, are showing very little creativity in the design of their buildings. Everything is the same. They're, they're Mason mod, masonry modern or, or Florida what, vernacular or whatever it is that they seem to be the choice. This Art Deco is getting way out of hand. The last one we saw was building by docks that they want. But there is was that building on 
Federal Highway that, with about four or five, four or five stores that they made Art Deco and it's just painted gray and it looks so out of place and and irregular. Then you go on North Federal Highway past um, past that St. George Apartments. They have that shopping center that's now painted white and green. That's Art Deco and. Nobody seems to want to do anything creative, I and mean, it's almost like with the, the the white house boxes that they stick up with windows in all different places. That you know, so I I applaud that there should be some uh, limitation on it, or some architectural review board, or something that uh, they can say no to. I mean, you know, we can't say no to it, but. I remember when they did Atlantic Crossing, and you know that architecture, which is just sort of like a mess now. I mean, it, there's no creativity in in that, particularly. Well, I don't think in any of the buildings, but in particularly the residential components in the back along Federal Highway. Um, you know, they dress it up by adding a, a plants on the side of the buildings already died a couple of times and they're replacing it but um, we've even even that I picked was better designed had a better design than a lot of the stuff that's coming across so I think there should be some limitation on it uh, and that's what they're trying to do huh? that's what they're trying to do <laughs> I agree. Maybe, you know, have, have an architect as one of the professionals in the department. Well, on the Sprad board. Huh? On the Sprad board. Somewhere. Yeah. 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 That's, those are my comments. Thank you. Snyder, any comments? Not really. I think this is a great idea, and I'm in favor of it. Great. Mr. Brown? <laughs> I, I want to make sure it's it's about design. You know, both Frank Lloyd Wright and, and a professor of mine, Louis Kahn from Penn, both got buildings turned down and uh, were fantastic buildings. And they got turned down because Louis Kahn decided he wanted all windows on the medical lab. <laughs> and then there was a huge protest. I, it, design is a very sensitive subject. And uh, you have to be careful about it, otherwise you end up knocking, dumbing it all down, and it looks worse than, than, than when you let somebody have a free hand in it. So uh, Art Deco is a very difficult design to copy. That is, that's one of the most difficult traditional designs. And of course, we see it in Miami, and it's beautiful in Miami. That's, that's fantastic design. But uh, it's being... It's being built here, and it's pretty ugly. I, I would agree. It's pretty ugly. So we have to put some something. I don't know what we do about it. It's hard. So we have to put it to a committee that will vote it in or vote it out. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Ms. Blankenship. Thank you. Um, I was speaking before the meeting started, and the attorney told me not to. So I'll just go ahead and say what I was saying um, before then on the record that um, I am not a fan of the masonry modern at all. I mean, I realized that this went before commission workshop, and that's where you've received your direction. Uh, but um, if it was, you know, uh, in my best case scenario, that would just not even be an option because I feel like a lot of uh, structures are being built to that style for whatever reason, um, whether it's um, economic or just quickness of getting it off, off the ground. Um, so I'm really not in favor of that. I think, uh, as uh, Mr. Zeller said, the Arca Deco is just out of control. Um, but I would say that I would add into that the, the one that has the columns looks like the Coliseum. That architectural style um, wouldn't be bad to come back before commission for um, approval before it's built, although we don't see a lot in the city. Can you just imagine one just uh, coming up in the CBD or something? It would look completely different in the character of the city. So I'm in favor of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blankenship. Ms. Howell? Just that I think this is a step in the right direction, and I'm glad to see some restrictions on these architectural styles. I, I'd be happy if it went further than this, but I understand that this is a good 
start. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Ms. Morrison? I'm all for um, encouraging creativity, so I'm in favor. Great. And my only comments are I'm in favor. Um, I agree 100% with Ms. Blankenship. Um, you know, masonry modern is getting a little overdone in the city. And um, maybe I'm crazy, but it's been my observation that as land and construction costs have skyrocketed since, let's say, 2019, 2020, since COVID, um, a lot of developers are getting squeezed and they're cheaping out on the designs even that they've shown us. Um, you know, a lot of things have changed from the design to make the buildings look a lot more plainer. And we've had discussions before this about architects being told, how about an efficient design <laughs> and what that means. And uh, we should demand a better product here in this town. And uh, definitely, and uh, I also agree with Ms. Blankenship regarding her comments regarding uh, Art Deco. Um, it's getting a little <laughs> too artsy maybe, I don't know, or too Deco, <laughs> I don't know, too Deco, yes. But um, no, I'm 100% in favor of the amendment and uh, you know, if you wanna tighten it up, especially around the masonry modern area, I think that um, people who come forth, that's the one area where they re-engineer it to make it look more stark, in my opinion. So that's it. Um, with that being said, I think all my colleagues have stated they're in favor. Who's in favor of making a motion? Mr. Go ahead, Ms. Morrison. Recommend approval uh, to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 12-23, amending Section 4.4.13F, Architectural Standards of the Land Development Regulations, to require City Commission approval of masonry modern and Art Deco architecture styles by finding that the amendment approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the applicable criteria in the Land Development Regulations. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Blankenship. Ms. Miller, when you get a chance, if you could please call the roll. Chris Brown? Yes. Gregory Steiner? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Joy Howell? Yes. Alan Zeller? Yes. Jillian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? Let the record show item number 9A passed with a vote of 7 to 0. <coughs> and with that, we can move on to our final item of the evening, number 9B. What I want to know is where's Ms. Alvarez? <laughs> we miss her. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I saw her name on here. I was like, aha. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So this is um, entering into the record file number 2023-097. So this is a, a pretty simple amendment. Uh, we want to amend the LDR to require just one regular meeting of SPRAB instead of two. Um, since at least the 1990s, it's been meeting twice a month. And part of it was, we think, to incentivize development when it was slow in the city. And then it became very necessary as um, in the development boom. Um, but in reality, as we're trying to draw different um, applications through a really um, rigorous review process, it may take them longer to get ready, and we don't always need to have two meetings a month. To have one meeting a month, we have to get approval from the city manager. So um, our other three boards uh, only have one meeting per month required. Um, we do continue to as a practice um, since 2020 we've had the permission to have one meeting a month and we've continued to reserve that second meeting if needed and I have a slide here so we have um, pretty consistently held two meetings a month as needed so we would still continue to exercise that option if the items were too many to, to put on a single agenda so this is just the language that's proposed and uh, we're also adding the option to cancel the meeting if there are no petitions before the board 
Um, again, it's just consistent with making our operations and development services go more smoothly. Mm -hmm. So these are your options for action, and if you have any questions, we can answer them. I just wanted to, I um, hope my colleagues don't mind me going first, but what about if we kept it at two meetings a month and they heard about the artificial turf at one meeting a month? <laughs> <laughs> Just for the sake of consistency, do you want to recognize? Yeah, public of course. Comment? I'm joking. I'm no, no, joking. no. I, I know. You really don't like those people, do you? Know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, they look so comfortable. Believe me. <laughs> is your air conditioning broken at home? <laughs> it is. There you go. I was going to say, if you're moving to the front row, you can stretch your feet out really far. <laughs> Um, does any member of the public wish to speak on this item? Please come forward and speak now. I don't know how many members of the public are concerned that the SPRAB maintain two meetings a month. I'll make a motion. <laughs> Ms. Finst? I, said, I don't want to come twice. I'll to come up to him. If you have a comment. Ms. Finst, if you have a comment, if you have a real comment, you have to come to the microphone. No comment. No comment. <laughs> I'm not getting up. I'm comfortable. <laughs> Can you make no comment without being sworn in? She's been yeah, sworn Yeah, we're sitting quite a tidy yeah. dish. <laughs> um, Alice Fence, 707, place to vote. I'd like to keep it at two meetings a month. Otherwise, you will have one very long meeting a month. Well, city staff will still have the option to do two meetings if they need to. But a lot of months, as you saw from the chart there, they're only doing one meeting a month. So the board will still have the option to have a second meeting should the agenda require it. We're just cleaning up the, the LDRs. OK. And then I'm thinking the length of time on that one meeting might be. But if it's not a long agenda, if there weren't many items on the agenda, they've had less items. So they're just going to have the option to have one meeting a month if they want. Well, can we make this sort of a conditional thing that we'll try it? Well, um, <laughs> we can rent, we can send it to the city commission, and they can uh, make a test period if they would like. Okay. 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 Thank you, Ms. Fence. Make a motion, please. Uh, recommend approval to the city commission of ordinance number. Can I make? Just one question, have a question about it. Oh, I'm Please. sorry. Sure, Ms. Zeller. I didn't get out of my huh. So, here's my biggest concern. When you, microphone. When, microphone, come on. My biggest concern is when you publish the meetings at the beginning of the year and, and all the board members conscientiously put in their calendars so that they could be here every year, every meeting. And when you change that, then it's going to be more difficult, particularly for the board members, the SPRAB members, to say, okay, I've, I've got one meeting a month locked in. Now you're asking me for essentially a special meeting, and I can't do it, or two people can't do it, or whatever. So I think that's somewhat uh, a problem. I don't know if it's a problem getting the city manager's permission or not I can't imagine that the city manager cares one way or the other uh, if you ask to cancel the meeting as it currently exists but I think that um, you know it is what it is if if you have the two meetings and everybody knows that you're likely only gonna do one meeting will still have it on their calendar to be available for that sep second meeting. So that's my only cautionary comment. Thank you. Good one, Ms. Zeller. One thing I'll just throw out there in response to Mr. Zeller's would be maybe the city commission wants to consider alternates to that board. So that if there are extra meetings, you could fill them with alternates if so, it's a problem. But I mean, that's a possibility, as you know, because you're up here serving. Right. These board these board meetings take a lot of time, and they require a lot of time from our from our staff. Uh, 
from us, but you're volunteering. <laughs> so so um, it's not a small ask, um, certainly. I do think, though, that there's, there's more than one reason for this. Um, ultimately, um, we have, as you know, we're booming. Um, when we're booming in Florida, it can be kind of hard to, to get planners and, and staff on the public side of things. Um, but we also have really complex projects that come through. Now, these aren't small projects that are moving through at all. So we do sort of run on a certain track, you know, where there's TAC review every two weeks, there's this, there's that. The time that it takes for Amy Alvarez, who's now the principal in charge of SPRAB, to put together an agenda and these, these things every two weeks, it's a bit frantic in a way. And we've always got people jostling which one are they trying to get onto. This has been, we started this in COVID, I believe, was when the initial shift happened because, you know, trying to move online was so cumbersome. Um, I do think it, it is a more efficient use of staff time. And while I'm telling you all of that, we're going to have two meetings in April because we have a number of pro big projects that were all ready for board action at the same time. And so we didn't have a problem getting a forum. Um, but perhaps you know, we would advertise that you were always going to meet on this meeting and this is the one that we would reserve and be able to tell them at the, at the, at the meeting like we do here, the next meeting is this, we're going to need two this time. Um, I, I hope that people are willing to serve and maybe it would make them more willing to apply for these boards um, if they only meet once a month as well. Because the ones that do meet more than once a month, which would used to be Board of Adjustment and then this one, they, are, they have been the most difficult ones to, to, to recruit. We do not currently, I think, have an architect that serves on SPRAB. And that's, you know, part of it. It's a critical makeup, right? So, yeah. um, you know, so it's, it, there's a few reasons why we want to cement it. but. Um, you know, we call this board for special meetings, and you're all very amenable, and we work to find the dates, but I think it's, it's a good point as well, the predictability. So we'll, we'll bring that message forward. Thank you. Blank and chip, please. Thank you. Recommend approval to the City Commission of Ordinance Number 13-23, a city-initiated amendment to Section 2.2.3 of the Site Plan Review and Appearance Board of the Land Development Regulations to reduce the number of required monthly meetings from two to one and to simplify language to improve readability by finding that the amendment and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in land development regulations. Second. Second by Ms. Morrison. Ms. Miller, if you could please call the roll. Chris Brown? Yes. Gregory Snyder? Yes. Christina Morrison? Yes. Joy Howell? Yes. Alan Zeller? Yes. Julian Blankenship? Yes. Chris Davey? Yes, let the record show, item 9B, passed with a vote of 7 to 0. Great. Ms. Dossery? So uh, the only updates are just the next meeting dates are April 17th and May 15th. The bike ped plan that we've been working on with the consultants, or the consultants have been working very hard on, is um, going to be presented at this meeting. So we look forward to your feedback on that. Great. Ms. Brandon? I don't have any comments. Thank you. You got it. I have one question sure. for Anthea. I just was wondering how the E plans rollout is going. Is it good? Oh, is it glitchy? You know, that's yeah. It's actually going um, quite well. I um, we were just talking about wanting to provide an update. Um, certain permits, like roof permits, um, Chris Buzine, who's um, you know the this this permit supervisor. Um, that's one of them been most one of the most successful um, rollouts when the minute that permit type shifted to e plans i think 80 percent of them have been done that way which saves two trips to the city right one to drop off the permit and one to come back and pay for it and pick it up so ecologically time wise you know review speed um but yes, I, I was. Um, I will work on providing, a, I think, a better update. I think the, if you're asking for it, I'm sure the commission would like to hear it too. Yeah, so indeed. thank you for, for asking. No thank Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Let the record show at 6:55 and meetings adjourned. Who called seven o'clock? <laughs> I gotta get out of here. I, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Who called seven? I was like, it wasn't me. I don't ever guess. Under? <laughs> I'm taking the under. The over. Or the over. Or the under. Or the over. 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 Or the
on the IT earlier. 